Okay, hello. Welcome to our spotlight talk today. Um, I'll just wait a couple of minutes to be sure that everyone um, has been able to get in before we get started with our program um, on Bort Neshrick and uh, one of his great patrons, Helena Fisher. Okay. Looking good. Okay, well, I am, uh, my name is Holly Gore. I am the Director of Interpretation and Research here at the Wharton Eschrick Museum. Um, and uh, today's program, as with all of our Spotlight Talks, will be a 20 minute program. Uh, we'll do a talk and then uh, save some time at the end for discussion. And um, I'm gonna ask you all, if you uh, have not already, please mute your microphones during the talk. Um, and if you have any questions or things you'd like to discuss further, uh, you can feel free to um, either type them into the chat at any time. Um, my colleague Katie Wynn is standing by uh, looking at the chat. Um, or also if you prefer to just save them um, to ask at the end. Uh, and so without further ado, I am going to share my screen and get started. Okay, so today's spotlight um, is on Helena Fisher, Wharton Eschrick and Furniture as Sculpture. It is in celebration of the exhibition Daring Design at the James Michener Museum in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Um, the exhibition, I'll just read a little bit of uh, the, the uh, description. Um, it explores the significant impact of three women, Helena Fisher, Hannah Weil, and Marjorie Content, on the artistic development and career of sculpture and studio craftsperson Burton Escherich. Um, the exhibition is curated by Laura Igo and Mark Safiri, and it is on view through February 6th. So still time to see a great assortment of uh, Escherich furniture, um, pieces by some of his close associates from the 1930s and 40s and some really kind of experimental interesting work there. Um, and so one of the things that I saw and responded to in the Daring Design exhibition was the way that it highlighted the people and the relationships and all of the ideas that were kind of swirling around Escherich when he began his career as a furniture maker um, and sculptor. And um, in that way, it really brought to focus the contributions of women in American modernism. I think when we look at sculpture or furniture um, at mid-century, we often don't see women's uh, contributions, but I think that the way this exhibition framed it was really nice in, in bringing forward um, the importance of these women who Eshrick was very close to. Um, and I just, with this talk, would like to linger that, on that idea um, a little bit more. There. So I'll just talk a little bit about who Helena Fisher was and how she came to know Wharton Eshrick. So Helena Fisher was a German American businesswoman. She was an art, art patron and a collector. She was born Helena Kurting in Germany in 1879. And she married a man named Adelbert Fisher, becoming Helena Fisher in that way. Uh, the Fishers emigrated to the United States in 1903. And the reason they did this was so that Adelbert could manage the family business, um, which was a valve instrumentation company called Schutte Kurting that Helena Fisher's father had um, established in Philadelphia. And so the Fishers settled in the Mount Airy uh, neighborhood of Philadelphia. They had a stately home built and they set about um, starting a family. They had a traumatic moment during World War I when they were accused of espionage. Um, Adelbert was actually interned, held as a POW during the war. Um, and the government seized, the United States government seized Schutte Kurting, and Helena was narrowly able to regain ownership. Um, after Adalbert Fisher passed away in 1942, Helena Fisher became the president of Schutte Kurting, and then after her retirement in the 1950s, she became the president of the board. And so here in this image, we see her sitting at her desk um, in the Schutte Kurting factory. So Helena Fisher first encountered Wharton Eshrick at a place called the Hedgerow Theater. Um, the Hedgerow Theater was a small repertory theater company 
Um, it actually still exists in a very different form than it did then. Um, but it was in Ro it is it still is in Rose Valley, Pennsylvania, um, which is south and west of Philadelphia and very near to the Wharton Escherich studio. Um, in Wharton Escherich's time, uh, the Hedro was a residential community of actors. It was a real gathering place for artists and intellectuals and thinkers. Um, and it was a center for Escherich's social and political life in that way. Um, one of the really uh, opportune things that he was able to do was to use the building as a kind of a gallery for his furniture and sculpture. Um, as he was just getting started out um, in the 1920s, he had began his tour, his, uh, he began his uh, a career as a painter, but then in the mid 1920s started moving towards sculpture and furniture making. And then he would uh, exhibit those things at the Hedgerow Theater. He also built a lot of furniture and some staircases for them. So people who were interested in the arts could come and um, see his things. Um, and such was the case was with one of the pieces you see here. Let's see if I can get a little pointer going. Here we go. Uh, this piece up here is called Finale. And it was on view at the Hedgerow Theater. Helena Fisher came to a performance, saw it, liked it, and bought it. And then soon after, she commissioned the cabinet you see below, using working as kind of a pedestal. Um, and she commissioned that to hold her Victrola and records. And here we see um, the, the uh, finale and the Victrola cabinet in Helena Fisher's home in Mount Airy. And uh, just to give you a sense of the scale of this house, this very large room we see with a stained glass window is actually an entry vestibule. Um, so Helena Fisher would continue to commission um, artworks from Wharton Escherich throughout the 1930s and 1940s, um, increasingly moving into a kind of mode of furniture that really was a kind of abstract sculpture. And so here is a piece that is a side table that Escherich made for a guest bedroom in Helena Fisher's home. This was completed in 1931. It's walnut. Um, it's kind of an, it has a kind of an abstract composition of triangles and in very, very many ways functions as a sculpture. Um, I really like how Escherich worked the wood grain to fit into these kind of triangular patterns um, to create the sense of, for me, a real sense of movement and dynamism. But there are also a lot of functional features built into here. So this little tassel here is a light pole that turns this bulb on. I don't know if you can see it real well in this black and white picture, but the bulb is actually sunk into a kind of a faceted recess that Escherich created for it. And then this whole panel here is a door that opens and there's shelving inside. And then this little handle here, that is where you would get your fingers under to open it. And then there's a long piano hinge down this side where it swings open. So a piece like this would obviously have been very experimental, very new for the time, would have required a lot of um, you know, creative vision on this, the part of Escherich, um, but also I think a kind of a willingness and faith from a patron to kind of go into the unknown with him and to fund that. And Escherich was very grateful uh, to Helena Fisher for the kind of freedom that um, her confidence and, and support, financial support um, afforded him. And I'm just gonna read a couple of excerpts from some letters that he wrote her where he thanks her um, for what she's done. So in one, in one case, she says, he says, thank you for the check and better still, the opportunity to try out another idea. And then in another, we artists start with an idea. How near to that idea we finish depends on so many things. And then I really like this one because evidently she'd been away for a while. And he said, I missed your encouraging spirit. You have a nice way of putting confidence into me in what I'm trying to do. I mean, what a nice thing to say to somebody. And uh, here just quickly is another piece um, that uh, Wharton Escherich did for Helena Fisher, um, where he's really working in the manner of furniture as abstract sculpture. Um, it's a corner desk um, built in 1931. And I should acknowledge that uh, with this piece, as with many of the pieces of this era, he built it 
with his cabinet maker, John Schmidt. So John Schmidt would have been doing the technical woodworking, um, all of the lovely joinery, the beautifully working drawers, um, the drop front that uh, you can kind of see in the color photo open, um, all of this really intricate woodworking. And then Escherich would have provided the design and also done the hand sculpting. And when I say hand sculpting, I mean details like this one here. This is a stack of drawers and these little angular triangular um, divots are actually kind of hand holes, something you get your hand under. Um, and uh, here, here's another view of the desk open. Um, and so Eshrick was really excited about this piece. He had um, an opening for it at his studio where he invited his front friends to come and see it before it went to Helena Fisher's home. Um, and then his friend, the writer Louise Campbell wrote a kind of a prose poem about the desk that she called a portrait of a desk. And in it, she characterized the piece as a piece of sculpture that evolved itself into a desk or rather a desk that evolved itself into a sculptural creation. So looking back at Escherich's time, it's really remarkable to me that he was able to work this way when he did, because this was the Great Depression and a lot of artists were really struggling just to work at all. And also the United States art scene was not super conducive to abstract art or abstract sculpture. Um, and I think for looking at Escherich's time, this is where his own library is just a really great resource. So I wanna take a little detour into a couple of the books that he owned and purchased around the time that he was doing these pieces for Helena Fisher. Um, so I wanna look at two books that he, he purchased in 1936 that were actually also published that year. And the way that we know that he had them in 1936 is that Escherich was in the, um, the habit of writing his name and the date on the title page when he got a book, which is great when you wanna trace what someone's looking at. Um, so he, advancing there. Um, so here is a page from a book called um, Art in Federal Buildings, Volume One, Mural Designs. And the book is just chock full of sketches for murals. Um, and this was for a um, mural project in Philadelphia. Um, and this is what we call New Deal art. It's funded by the federal government during the 1930s as part of a series of programs that were designed to give uh, work to out of, out of work artists. Um, so kind of a work relief program, treating artists just like any other kind of worker. Um, and this mural is really typical of the kinds of styles that they use, telling representation, uh, re really recognizable stories. This was for um, Pittsburgh and they're showing the development of steel. So something of local interest. Um, and it's very, it's representational, meaning it represents kind of recognizable um, stories and people. Um, so very different from what Escherich was doing with this very abstract work. Um, and also a lot of New Deal art administrators really avoided um, uh, sponsoring abstract art because they felt that um, wide audiences would not relate to it, that it was too elitist. And um, so uh, that's one, sort of one end of the scope of what Escherich's looking at. And then here from the very same year, um, a totally different world. Um, this book is called uh, Cubism and Abstract Art. And it is um, an exhibition catalog for a show that was at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and what is interesting to me about this is that it was a very large show of abstract art, a lot of sculpture, um, but almost exclusively given over to European artists. So um, above we have a piece called Head Landscape by Alberto Giacometti, who is Swiss, and below a wood sculpture by uh, Henry Moore called Two Forms, and Henry Moore being a um, um, English artist. So, you know, an exhibition like this and a publication like this would give some, you know, artists like Wart Nesterich, uh, American sculptors, a, a lot of, maybe a lot of inspiration in looking at what was going on in Europe, but maybe not so much in the way of um, real opportunities for exhibiting um, and selling their work. Um, but this is not to say that there was no innovative sculpture um, happening at the time. 
So as a case of Isamu Noguchi, uh, one of my favorite sculptors shows up, uh, shows. Um, Noguchi was a Japanese American sculptor and designer. And I've always found in his work a lot of parallels with Escherich, a lot of really interesting kind of doing similar things at similar times. Um, they both began their career in sculpture in the late 1920s. Um, this is when Escherich is moving into sculpture and furniture making from painting. Um, and Noguchi is at that time in Paris studying with Constantine Brancusi, um, who was a sculptor that Escherich was very interested in. Um, and both of these artists really push the boundaries of modernist sculpture by working across um, this kind of fine art sculpture that doesn't have a purpose and also making functional objects and making functional objects as sculptors. Um, and so the, the slide I'm showing here um, just shows one of many um, uh, stage sets that Noguchi did for Martha Graham. He started uh, working with her in the 1930s. Um, and this piece here is uh, a stage set for, uh, it's called Mirror Before Me. And it come, it's made up of three props, very sculptural props that depict the furniture in a woman's dressing room. So here is a chair. And this piece back here is a clothes rack. And the audience knows that it's a clothes rack because um, the um, dancers hang part of their costume on it. And then this very abstract piece here is a mirror. And again, we know that it's a mirror because of the way that enter dancers interact with it. Um, and so these kind of sculptural props become a really big part of Martha Graham's identity as a dancer and choreographer who is really modern and cutting edge. You know, she's not doing what other people have done before with using painted backdrops. Um, and she's really using these very sculptural pieces and that really work as extensions of her body. And here we see her in a publicity shot in the chair where it really becomes an extension of her. So cycling back around to um, Asherick and uh, Helena uh, Fisher, um, we get, I think a really kind of similar vision comes across of uh, these kind of objects becoming a part of a woman's identity as a really a modern person um, in the uh, piece that Louise Campbell, Asherick's writer friend wrote about a portrait of the desk. And I just wanna read the end of the piece for you because um, I think it's really great. So she writes, um, a woman's desk, her evening gowns are by Patu, sports clothes by Chanel, pajamas by Nowinski, luggage by Vuitton, her perfume and lipstick as modern as her desk. Words by Gertrude Stein, E.E. E. Cummings and James Joyce to music by Stravinsky and rhythmics by Mary Wigman with explanatory notes by D.H. Lawrence assisted by Henry Ford, merged into sculptural expression by Wharton Eschereck. And one of the things I really love about this is that uh, Louise Campbell puts together a kind of a scenario where James Joyce and Henry Ford are in the same category as Chanel perfume and lipstick. You know, these kinds of things that women use that are often kind of trivialized in a way all become these expressions of people, um, you know, a very, really diverse group of people thinking about what it means to be modern. And I'll just finish. Uh, on an image of Helena Fisher sitting at a different kind of desk. Um, so when Helena Fisher assumed the helm of Schutte Kurting, um, the family business um, in 1942, one of the first things she did was to have Warden Escherich build furniture for her office and conference room. Um, so what we're looking at is an Escherich desk, um, a chair, a door, a door handle, um, a kind of another view on the kinds of things that um, a modern woman uses. So that's that's what I have. I will um, thank you for listening and I will stop sharing my screen and I will open it up to questions. Hi. Is the studio armed? I think so. I <laughs> had a visitor. <laughs> um, Okay. Any questions or comments?
I'll just chime in, Holly. It was wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, uh, in the chat, as we've been going along, we did have a couple of questions that we feel. Okay. Yeah, I'm um, okay. And uh, what, one of them was about where some of these pieces are now. Uh huh. Um, including, you know, private collections. Right. Um, the table with the light is part of the Michener show. Right. Um, as are and many some of them are in museums as well. Is that right? Yeah, so some, so I, I, it was a piece that is in the Mishner show, but I didn't show. Eshrick made a cabinet um, for the Helena Fisher to store her um, ever-growing record collection. Once the Victrola cabinet filled up, there was a kind of a bench and a cabinet that he built uh, that is in, the, I think, the University uh, um, the Art Institute of Chicago collection. Um, I know the Michener show uh, has a lot of the... Um, the uh, pieces from the Schutte Kurting um, conference room that there's a large conference table. And we have here at the museum, I was looking around to see what we had kind of um, uh, you know, evidence of their collaboration. And Escherich did make some <coughs> versions of the, uh, the chairs that he made for the Schutte Kurting conference room we call them the sk chairs and he made several and you know he be, being the experimentalist he was he really did he kind of did some variations on them with different fabric and fabric versus leather the original ones were kind of a red leather it would have been really uh, i think you know, it's just one thing to bring up also i feel like the um the black and white photos misses a lot of the color aspect of these things um That'll, so, uh, but yeah, so we have a couple of those things here. Holly, could you speak to um, their exact collaboration in the sense of, um, did she kind of dictate to him form, function, whatever, or did she just say, I need a desk, please make me a beautiful desk? How did that work? Yeah, that's a great question, right? And I think as with so many of these artist collaborations that are very um, friendly, and I think this is the case with also Martha Graham and Noguchi. Um, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> it's it's sometimes difficult to know the exact conversations because they were just two friends talking. You know, people they they didn't draft things up in formal contracts or letters. But I think in a lot of the letters that we see from Escherich to her, he talks about, and there's one that I didn't quote because it was very long, but he says, you know, I was really going after a mood and she, you say this makes you feel like a sailboat. And that's what I was going after. I was going after the wind and the feeling of freedom. Um, and so I think, it seems to me that she would have asked for specific pieces. You know, the fact that he built her a Victrola cabinet and then he built her a bench that would store her ever expanding record collection that didn't fit in the old cabinet. So it seems to me that yes, she would have said, I need a conference table, I need a desk. But as to what they, ex you know, as to the, the final outcome, my thinking is that Escherich had a lot of freedom in experimenting and that's why he thanked her so many times and really valued her um, her as a patron. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I think a lot of times, you know, we think of art artists as, as being creative, um, but maybe not so much acknowledging the kinds of the kind of fertile grounds that that creativity might fall on. Yeah, if, if I could add to that, please. Wonderful talk, thank you. Um, it was wonderful to see the letter here about the letters that Effort wrote to her, yeah. expressing how much he appreciated her encouragement. When I would do tours, I would talk about how friends would commission pieces, people who commissioned work would become friends. So I would talk about the relationship, but I never really, I was remiss in not mentioning how encouraging that mm -hmm. was to Escherich. And I mm -hmm. think that's something we need to highlight in the tours and, and maybe without being heavy handed, encourage people if they know an artist or an artisan that they appreciate, uh, support them, you know, let them know you appreciate their work. Yeah, that's a great sentiment. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what uh, comment? I'd just I'll... like to, to remind, to tell people that we did have the desk in the museum one summer and it was really cool to see 
because there's so many different ways the drawers open and so many hidden compartments. And um, the woman who owns the desk now, which is I think her granddaughter, um, would not allow anyone else to open the desk except herself. She was here and demonstrated it for us. Also would like to remind people that it's a corner desk. So she must have asked him to make a corner desk uh, for a specific space. Yeah, I was. I saw the desk when it was here too. I was. I was visiting at the time, and it was just absolutely fantastic to see. Um, and I think you know, looking at the at the Michener exhibit, that that little uh, bedside table is also a really fantastic piece. Although, of course, when it's in a, a museum exhibit, you you um, aren't able to see the inside often, um, which is, I think, one of the wonderful things we do on tours here, where we're able to demonstrate for visitors, you know, opening the things and showing them how the, the doors open and all the little nooks and crannies. It's it's kind of like exhibiting books, you know, books are made to have the pages turned and these things are made to be okay. opened and, and looked at in that way and used. Um, one comment I'd like to make about the uh, the boardroom table that's on exhibit uh, that was lent by the Philadelphia Museum of Art from the Schutte and Kurting uh, conference room is that uh, I believe uh, that they uh, acquired it in 1972. And I believe that this is the first time it's been on display in 50 years. Wow. So I don't think it was ever displayed at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Wow. Yeah. Mark, do you, know, do you know what other um, what other pieces from the um, boardroom that the Philadelphia Museum of Art owns? Um, well, they have everything. They have the boardroom table. They have six chairs that went around it, and there's a small desk that you showed an image of um, uh, Elena sitting at. That was her mm -hmm. desk. And there's a trash can, and there's a. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember. There's a couple of other smaller, smaller pieces. One thing that surprised me by the conference table was how small it was. <laughs> yeah, it looks really big in some of the photos. It looks like it's a 12 foot table, but it's yeah. not, you know. Yeah. No, thanks. Um, I was wondering, oh, by the way, that was, it was really a good talk. I really appreciate it. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned the influences. Was there ever any reference that Calder might have been an influence to uh, Escherich? Um, so that's that's a great question. Um, Calder, so by Samo Noguchi's account, Alexander Calder was one of the only artists in the United States who was able to make a living during the depression off of abstract sculpture alone. So it's Calder, who's very well known for his, um, his mob mobiles, the hanging, hanging abstract sculptures. Um, I was reading, you know, I was looking through some oral histories and I read that some people really thought Eschrick didn't like Calder and would get very annoyed if people mentioned Alexander Calder, but no one knew exactly why. So I would have to say, yeah, he knew who he was, but there was some, some sort of feeling of animosity there. <laughs> Holly, I, I did notice there was one other question at the bottom of the chat too, just asking about one of the quotes by oh. Campbell and what book that appeared in. Um, so the way I know of this is as an unpublished manuscript. So it, it is not, it's, it's just an archival find. It's not, um, it's not, it's not published. And I don't know, you know, it's interesting to me. I don't know why she wrote it. And it's it's sort of like some of the photos I showed of Helena Fisher with the Escherich um, furniture. You know, is it a portrait of her or is it a portrait of Escherich's furniture? Or, and so did Louise Campbell write this to promote, you know, to be about Wharton Escherich or is it really to celebrate his patron? It's kind of both. And I, that's one of the reasons I, I really like it and think it's interesting is it's showing this kind of real kind of merging of, you know, the the patron, the patron's identity and their own kind of self-fashioning with the artist's creativity. I just want to shout out to you guys too, because um, 
what I find really interesting about all this furniture is that it's designed for private home, right? Or, or a boardroom or whatever. And yeah. so it gets sucked into a void kind of it's, it's, you know, a company goes out of business, a patron dies, whatever. And then it goes somewhere and it's either in a storage or in a private home. Sometimes it gets into a museum, but I love places like Escherich, uh, mm -hmm. the Escherich Museum, because we, the public can actually go and see and touch these pieces. And without that, where would these pieces be? They'd just be hidden somewhere. Yeah. So thank you for keeping the history alive and keeping the physical objects safe and all that stuff. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, preservation is a huge part of what we do. But yeah, that is such a great point because you know I've often thought about Eshrick having his opening reception for the desk as being a little bit more than you know just kind of a victory dance of I made something really cool, but like it's going into a private home. And if it's gonna come out on view, if it's gonna be exhibited, it's gonna be at one person's discretion. And I've often wondered if you know, that's kind of why Escherich has done, you know, did so much of this really innovative work in the 1930s and 40s and was just such an under the radar artist. And maybe because it's in private, you know, so much of it was in private homes, I'm not sure. Holly, I see one other question in the chat, which I think we, we have time for if you do. Um, yeah. Just asking if there's any, um, you know, more like in-depth workings or photos of, you know, the interiors of some of these pieces. Um, I don't know if you have any knowledge of that or if anyone else on the call has insights. So I found some yesterday. So the the photos of Helena Fisher at Schutte Kurting, I just shoved into the into the into the presentation yesterday because I thought they were so great. Um, and there are a few more in that file of the boardroom, which I actually will I plan to include in a, a blog post that we'll do. So stay tuned for that. Um, there are a few more images of Helena Fisher's home, but they're really fragmentary. They, you know, it's like the it, photograph of the bedside table and you get just a little bit of the bed or he did a, he actually did a kind of a, a basin for her a corner sink. That's kind of interesting, but it's real close up, you know, so you don't really get the whole view of the room. So I would be, yeah, I would be very interested if others have come across um, images of these things in their original, you know, context that they were designed for. Um, if the question is about uh, inner workings in action of these pieces, I did write an article called Anatomy of a Masterpiece about the corner desk. And I, there are a lot of uh, shots that I took of, of that desk. It's on my website if you're interested. And I think they sell it at the museum too. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's a great, I, I've looked through that publication. It's a great tour. If you can't stand there and actually open all of the drawers, you can kind of see them, all the different pieces coming together and opening and sliding and whatnot. And Mark, I couldn't remember, does the corner desk have a light, a fold out light? I know a lot of Escherich's pieces have fold out lights. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I was trying to think, did I remember that right? Or did I just invent? <laughs> In the back section. Uh, not the top triangle, but the next one down is a light that pivots and turns on. So creating a nice little environment. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's really great to connect virtually in this way. Um, and uh, that's all I have for now. Katie, do you have anything else to add before we? No, I'll just say um, to everyone, again, thank you all for coming. And um, we will send around a follow-up email after the event um, with, a, with a link to it in case you want to watch it again, um, as well as a link to some of these different resources that we've been talking about. So we'll uh, be sure to connect you with all of that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.